Alhamdulillah. Was salat was salam. Al Rasulillah wa ala alayhi wa sallam ajma'in. Amma ba'd. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu. Wa amilu salihati. Wa tawasaw bil haqqi tawasaw bil sabi. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yasalli amri. Wa halu al-ugdata min lisani yafqa wa kawli. I welcome all the viewers of the Peach TV Network, the Peach TV English, the Peach TV Urdu, the Peach TV Bangla, and the Peach TV Chinese, as well as my four social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and the Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be on all of you. I welcome all of you to this program of Ask Dr. Zakir. To the season one, session three. And here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim or an atheist may have posed against Islam or any questions regarding the current affairs. You can pose your question on any of the social media platforms, but the best would be you can send the question in brief as a text message mentioning your name and your profession, the city and the country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine. 53895. The first question that we have is from Pooja Pradeep. Quran says sperm is produced in between backbones. How is it possible? That means the Quran is corrupted. The sister asked a question that the Quran says that human beings are created from, uh, from sperm, which is emitted from the backbones, and this is not possible, so the Quran is corrupted. What the sister is referring to is a verse in the Quran from Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 5, 6, and 7, where Allah SWT says that let man think from what he's created. He's created from a drop which is emitted from a space between the backbone and the ribs. But the sister may not be aware that she may not be aware of the medical knowledge and if you refer to any book on embryology or human development, these scientific books will tell you that a human being in the embryonic stages, while the development takes place in the womb of the mother, when the human being is a fetus, originally the, the organs, the reproductive organs, in the male, the testes, they originate from a space which is same as that of the kidney, between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib. So this is the origin of the gonads, of the ovaries and the testes, which are the reproductive organs. And later on, these, these reproductive organs that descend. In the female, it descends to the true pelvis. And in the male, via the inguinal canal, it goes into the scrotum. But even in the adult life, after the reproductive organs have descended to the position, yet they receive the blood supply from the space from the same space where the kidney is present between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib. And even the venous return goes back to the same space. Even the nerves come from the same space. So Alhamdulillah, at a time when medical science wasn't advanced and the human being did not know that, 1400 years ago, the Quran mentions about the scientific fact which we came to know now. And yet, most of the human beings who don't know about medical science don't know. So it was the ignorance of Sister Puja that because she is unaware of the medical science, 
she thinks that the Quran is corrupted. Alhamdulillah, the glorious Quran is the last and final word, message of Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was revealed 1400 years ago. So imagine what science came to know yesterday, 40 years back, 50 years back, 100 years back. The Quran mentioned 1400 years ago. So this is one of the proofs that there is not a single scientific mistake in the Quran and there are so many things what the Quran mentioned and science has come to know about it today. So this is one of the proofs and signs that Quran is from our creator, almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. The next question is from Aliza Fatima. She's studying MBBS from Pakistan. When a corrupt leader is elected, we are, also, we are also responsible for the sins he commits as a leader. What should be our priorities while electing a leader? In today's circumstances, when we cannot find a loyal and honest leader, what should we do? Should we give our vote or waste our right to elect? A similar question is posed by Majid Khan from Hyderabad, India. What are the qualities which we should look for in today's age for selecting a leader for the Muslims? According to me, Dr. Zakir Naik would be my best choice to lead the Muslim Ummah today. Basically, the question posed here is that in today's world, most of the Muslim leaders are dishonest, they are corrupt. So who should we choose? Or should we let our vote go in waste? And the second question is that what are the qualities that a Muslim leader should have? And the brother suggested that I should be the leader, which will come to it later on, which I'll answer, inshallah. As far as what should the qualities of a Muslim leader be is the best exemplary Muslim leader in the world is a beloved Prophet Muhammad. That is the reason Michael H. Hart, he places him number one in the list of 100 most influential human beings in the history of humankind. Imagine he being a non-Muslim places Muhammad as number one and he says that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was not only successful as a religious leader, he was even successful as a social and a political leader. Because of that, he placed him number one. That he was not only a successful religious leader, he was also a successful social and a political leader. So the best example of a political leader in the world today we have is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. After that, we have the example of the Khulfa Rashidin, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali. They are best examples for us after the Prophet. And that is the reason Michael H. Hart, he places you know, Umar al-Khattab as number 51 because he was a very successful leader. So if today, unfortunately, I don't know of any Muslim leader who is anywhere close to the quality of leadership of Prophet Muhammad not even 0.001%. Leave us as that, not even close to Hazrat Umar an. Umar bin Khattab, mashallah, he was, he was so successful that he expanded uh, the, the rule of the Muslim empire, mashallah. And if you read his seerah, you will find the example how a Muslim leader should be. Unfortunately, unfortunately today, None of the Muslim leaders, we have about 40, we have about 56 to 57 countries in which majority of the people are Muslims in some country, 100%, some more than 95, some more than 90, some more than 50%. There are about 57 countries in the world out of a little bit more than 200 countries. That means more than 27% of the countries in the world, they, they are countries in which Muslims are in majority. Unfortunately, None of these leaders are anywhere close to Umar al-Khattab. No way close. 
And if you read the seerah of, of Hazrat Umar, may Allah please with him, he told his family that if any of my family members break any of the rules, they will get double punishment because the family of a caliph should be following the rules much more than others. If they break any rule, they will get double punishment. And you have several examples. Unfortunately, we find today that most of the Muslim leaders, they are more, as, as the sister rightly asked the question, that most of them are corrupt. Most of them are dishonest. They are involved more in making money for themselves, unfortunately. Just let me give you one example of Hazrat Umar Radilawan. That when he was the Khalifa, you know, he had uh, uh, two of his sons, Abdullah and Ubaidullah. May Allah be pleased with them both. When they went to the governor of Basra, when they were passing Basra, the governor called them and he was very happy to meet them. He said, what can I do for you? Then he said, why don't you give this amana to Amirul Mumini, to your father, the Umar al-Khattab is one. But I give you permission that on your way you can utilize the money for business and when you get the principal amount back, keep the profit and you can give the principal amount back to Amrul Momini. So both the sons of uh, Umar Adela one, they take the money and on the way they do business and they get a huge profit and they go and give the principal amount to their father Amrul Momini and they say this is what the governor of Basra said and this is the Amana. So Hazrat Umar was angry and he asked his sons that did the governor give this money to somebody else? They said no. So how come they, how come he has given it to you? So Umar al commanded to his sons that give the principal amount as well as the complete profit. Give everything to Baitul Mal. Then the people who were close to Hazrat Umar al the other sahabas, they told that this is a business deal and the permission was given by the governor. So what is their fault? And if it's a business deal, we're allowed to do that. So finally, after a lot of discussion, when they said that, you know, he should change his ruling, then Hazrat Umar Adalan said, okay, fine, give 50% of the profit to the Baitul Mal. So we see he was so strict and he made it a law that any of his governor, before they appointed, he checks their wealth. And once they relieve the post, he checks their wealth again. And he allows only a small percentage of increase. Anything more than that, he said, give it to Baitul Mal. Not that he accused them of corruption. No. He said that means even if you spend more time in the worldly affairs, you are not fit to be a governor. If you want to be a governor under my rule, you have to give your pure time to your duty. Even if you make money, honestly, that is not your purpose. Unfortunately, we see today in the Muslim Ummah, most of the Muslim leaders, they are far away from the deen. If you just take the basic concept of Salah, I believe more than 50% of the Muslim leaders, they may not be offering five times Salah in congregation. There may be a handful, just a small percentage who may be offering five times Salah that are also in the congregation. So unfortunately, the state of the Muslim Ummah today, we have gone far away from the Quran and Sunnah. That's the reason we have today that the situation that the Ummah is in today because we have gone far away from the Quran and the Sunnah. We have gone far away from the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teachings of beloved Prophet Muhammad And I do agree with the sister that today unfortunately the choice that we have is so limited and unfortunately most of them would not fit the criteria of how a Muslim leader should be as per the Quran and Sunnah. So what should we do in this situation? What we have to do is that we have to select the best of the worst. And if we analyze, as I mentioned, that almost all the leaders, they don't have the qualities that a true Muslim leader should have, like Hazrat Umar or even a small percentage, not even 2% of the quality of Hazrat Umar so what we have to do, we have to select the best of the worst. And I do agree with the sister that almost all of the Muslim politicians, they are corrupt, whether it be financially, whether it be with Iman, they are almost all. There may be one or two or three exceptions to the rule. So what should we do in this situation? 
as I mentioned, we should select the best of the worst. Number one, according to me, is that select that Muslim leader who is becoming a leader on the Islamic card. That he's proud to be a Muslim and he says that I will, I'm proud to be a Muslim and I will upheld the Islamic law. Whether he does or not is secondary. Because in today's world, the basic rule for a politician today, unfortunately, is that he has to maintain his chair. By hook or by crook. It may go against his set of rules. It may go against his deen. It may be, go against his family. As long as he is sitting on the chair, he is happy. So he will do anything to maintain his chair. Because of this reason, my first advice is that if two, two Muslim leaders are standing, select that Muslim leader who openly says that he is proud to be a Muslim and he is coming on the Islamic card. He may or may not be a practicing Muslim that is secondary. I will go to the extent of saying that if there is one Muslim leader who is practicing Islam 20% but is coming on the secular card, he is not saying that I will protect the Muslims, I will follow Islam and there is another Muslim leader who is following 10% of Islam but he is coming with the Islamic card. He is openly saying that I will, I will protect the religion of Islam, I will, I will protect the Muslims. Better select the person who is following 10% Islam as coming with the Islamic card rather than the other Muslim leader who is following 20% and is not coming on the Islamic card because the person who is not coming on the Islamic card will not go out of his way to follow the Islamic principles because that, is not, that was not his trump card to win the election. Whereas the other Muslim leader who may not be following Islam as much as the other person, both are below average, but at least because he's come with the Islamic card, he will see to it that he will make more, he'll make more massages. He may not pray Salah, but he'll see to it he will make more massages, more mosques. He will protect the law of Islam. He will help the Muslim because his trump card to win the election was the Islamic card. This is a very key point. Unfortunately, and we know, as the sister rightly said, that majority, almost all are corrupt. So, but if you have a corrupt leader who's coming with the Islamic card, is better than a corrupt leader who's coming without the Islamic card. There are maybe one, two or three, if we search in the Muslim Ummah, who may be following majority of the Farais in Islam. But they may not be having the acumen to be a good leader. We have on the other example some Muslim leader who I have praised in my speech. They may be bold. They may stand for justice. They may not be following Islam to the T. They may not be offering five times Salah, may be offering maybe a few times in a week. But they may openly protect the Islam because, because that is their principle but they are not doing it for the Islam because they are doing because that is what they feel is right. They are more for the cause of humanity but Islam is far above humanity. So because of that they may be they, they may bring a voice in the international media but their practice may not be Islamic. So such leaders may benefit in one particular aspect of Islam to the Muslim Ummah. But on the other hand, there may be a danger. So that is the reason I personally prefer that you select those Muslim leaders who number one are proud to be Muslims. Unfortunately, when you look at the Muslim leaders, most of them they are not following the Sunnah. I am giving a small example of keeping a beard. It's not a big thing. To keep a beard doesn't take any effort. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, as mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, in volume number 7, hadith number 5, 5892, the Prophet said that do the opposite of what the mushriks do, what the unbelievers do. Grow your beard and trim your moustaches. According to all four schools of thought, all the four ahimmas, keeping a beard is fard. It's such a small effort. But yet, unfortunately, majority, more than 75% of the Muslim leaders who are men, they don't have a beard. Why? That means they are not proud to be Muslims? This is, that doesn't mean if you keep a beard you have fulfilled all the requirements. No, please don't get me wrong. In requirements, you have to follow 
the 70 major sins and see how good the person is. So what we have to realize, my basic point here is that select those Muslim leaders who are proud to be Muslims, even though they may be less in practice. A person who is proud to be a Muslim and a practicing Muslim it is the best. Who is practicing and keeping, doing all the farais? I don't think so. If you search, you may find one or two, but on the face of it, I cannot. They may not be good leaders, but they may be following the farais. So here, see to it that you like those who are coming with the Islamic card and those who are proud to be Muslims and present themselves as Muslims, are not shy when they meet the non-Muslim leaders, they are not shy to present themselves as Muslims. Now coming to the, uh, to the second part of the question, that these criteria, the best is read the Sira of the Prophet and Sira of Hazrat Umar Adilawan, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali and you see the examples in their life, how, how honest and none of these leaders, they wanted to become leaders. The hadith of the Prophet, anyone who wants to be an Amir, wants to be a leader, is not the right person. Here we find that most of the leaders want to be leaders. In the Islamic teachings, a person who himself wants to be a leader, should not be made the leader. The other people who make him, and all the Khalifas, they were made by others. And you have these examples. As far as the question posed by the brother Majid, that he feels that Dr. Zakir Naik is the best choice. I am sorry, I disagree with you totally. I don't have the qualities to be a leader at all. And I don't consider myself. And what I've seen in my life, in my personal life, I've seen that many religious people, when they enter into politics, almost all of them went away from their deen. I know several scores of Muslims who are very good practicing Muslims, who are offering five times Salah, who are very honest and they give such beautiful lectures. But the moment they entered politics, they got corrupt, they got influenced. Because unfortunately, the Ummah that we have today, they are not like the Sahaba at the time of the Prophet and Khulfa Rashidin. Our Khulfa Rashidin, first they would take decision thinking, what would Allah want me to do? They were more scared of disappointing Allah. Today, our politicians are more interested in how it will benefit them personally. They don't, they don't want to disappoint the vote bank. The Khulfa Rashidin, they did not want to disappoint Allah. They would take a decision which would be completely against them. As long as it pleases Allah. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 135. That, Ya amunu, O you believe, stand out for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your kitakin, against the rich or poor. Allah protects all. So such type of quality... You know, so I, there were many times the question was asked to me in India that why don't I enter politics and I said that, I mean, why do you want to become enemy? I mean, I have to jokingly tell them. Because in today's world, if you enter politics, there are high chances that you will spoil your akhirah. Very high chances. Because the way the ummah and the society is made, that if you want to live and remain in that seat, you will have to compromise on your principles. And the best example I can give you is of Dr. Israel Ahmed. Dr. Israel Ahmed, you know that, mashallah, he was a very great guy and he gave tafsir of the Quran, he was very knowledgeable, he was popular and he stood for election and he won the election. After he won the election, he got a uh, member of parliament he was made and he was given some post and after a few months he resigned. He said, they're asking me, how, what should be the width of the road? That's not what I'm made for. When I'm giving them Islamic solution, they don't want to listen. He immediately resigned. So a good person who is following the deen, he will either have to give up his deen or give up his position. And whatever Dr. Isra Ahmed did was the best. There may be few people like Dr. Isra Ahmed who may be Islamic and may have got into politics, but I don't know anyone who is a leader. May have come on a lower position, not as the head of state, and maybe following the deen. But the way the society is made today, our ummah, you will either have to give up the post that you are in or give up the deen. So first of all, I'm not fit to be in that position. Neither do I want to spoil my akhirah. I would, I'm very happy in being a dai and I'm very satisfied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever ni'amah has given me.
we have on the Facebook. So good person who is following the deen, he will either have to give up his deen or give up. We have Sadiq Afridi, Muhammad Tariq, Bhat Sanjay, Abdu Chef, Jamil Ahmed, Muhammad Nabit, Abde El Hakim, Anas Ketch, Anwar Khan, Kamrul Hassan, Haris Khan, Pharmacist Shafiqul Islam. Most of them are saying Assalamu Alaikum and I say Walaikum Assalam to all of you. Ar Shalbi, Azad Rahman. Many are giving duas and may Allah reward you for that. We have on the on the YouTube we have on the YouTube we have Azaruddin Malik, we have Hosef Zargar. Hamza Mateen, ADSH, Mr. Haza, Taslimul Hassan, Saad Atar, Abdul Samad, Shahbaz Ahmed, Araf Pidi, Azharuddin Malik, Isfaq Ahmed, Hamza Mateen, Huzayf Zargar, Aisha Khan, and Jazakallah for all the good wishes. May Allah's mother accept it. And I pray to Allah's mother that may He guide all of, all of us to the straight path. The third question from Muhammad Sirajuddin Lahore, Pakistan. Most of the Muslim countries in the world are facing problems. They are being put on sanctions being boycotted, they are being blacklisted, blackmailed, threatened or attacked. Muslims in most parts of the world are being humiliated, they are being persecuted, oppressed and even lynched. According to you, what is the solution? I do agree with this brother Muhammad Sarajuddin from Pakistan that unfortunately today we find in the Muslim Ummah most of the Muslim countries, they are being blackmailed, they are being blacklisted, their sanctions have been put, they are being threatened, they are being attacked, you know, for no, for no fault of theirs. Muslims are being humiliated, there are rights, Muslims are being lynched. What is the solution? According to me, the solution Allah gives in the Quran is Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, where Allah says that, Wa tasimu wala Hold all together strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. If the Muslim Ummah is united, then inshallah will be a strong force and no one will be able to bully us. The problem today is that the Muslim Ummah is divided and we are not close to the Quran and Sunnah. The only way that Muslims can be united is holding the rope of Allah. The rope of Allah, it is the glorious Quran and the authentic Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if all the Muslims hold strongly to the glorious Quran, which is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the things of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that are there in the Sahih Hadith, if we hold strongly to this, and if we are united, then we will be a strong force. Today, there are about 2 billion Muslims in the world. Out of 7.75 billion human beings in the world, more than 26% of the world population today, they are Muslims. If you see the example of China, China, about 1.4 billion, approximately 18% of the world population, today they are a big force and they are so big that they least bother about the rest of the world. They themselves are 1.4 billion. Do you know whatever social media that is there throughout the world, it is influencing the world, but it is not influencing China because they have banned Facebook, they have banned YouTube. They have banned Google, they have their own alternative. They have Baidu, they don't have WhatsApp, they have got WeChat. 
so they have got their own alternative and 18% according to them is is a big chunk that's the reason today they are number two in the world but in many aspects they're number one and the way they are developing coming from very low the way they have come up in the last few decades is phenomenal because they're united so we have to take the good points there are many negative points of china but the good point is they're united and they themselves are a big force so much so that even america is afraid what my suggestion is that the muslims should be united they can have their country no problem but as a whole we should be united today we have the united nation organization uno so whatever UNO say, most of them follow except the big superpower, the five or six countries which have got the veto power. Besides them, everyone has to follow. If they don't follow, then they twist their arm, they put sanction, they put embargo, and they, they have arm twisting policy for their own benefit. If they want to attack, if they want to take over Iraq, they create false, the big superpower, America and UK, they create false evidence and they attack attack Iraq not that Saddam Muslim was a very good Muslim but what right did America USA and UK to attack Iraq and after they attacked Iraq was worse than what it was before what were the Muslims doing they were just sitting they were fighting among themselves we Muslims should be united whatever said and done First of all, we should remove, let our differences aside and we should unite. We should unite. We may not agree with certain policy of, um, of the other Muslim country. But on the basis of Quran and Sunnah, we should unite and we should have our own united Muslim organization. Like they have UNO, we should have UMO. All the 57 Muslim countries should have united. Forget about what we have in the past. We have some organization, but they are not effective at all because they are controlled by one or two we should be united on the basis of quran if we are united on the basis of quran let quran be a constitution practically not theoretically there are some muslim countries theoretically quran is a constitution but most of the things which quran prohibited is goes on in that country it's only for theory we should practically have quran as a constitution and have united and we should have we should have alternative like how there is a World Trade Organization, WTO. We should have a World Trade Muslim Organization, WTMO. And I'll give you an example. We Muslims, we have the GCC, Gulf Cooperation Countries. The six countries, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, Qatar, Oman, Bahrain. These six countries, are close to each other and they produce oil they have got petrol and if they fight among themselves the others will take advantage so many years back they made a corporation gulf countries corporation so that they can fix the price so that everyone benefits in this way not only should we have for the petrol we should have for palm oil the two muslim countries which produce the maximum number of majority of the export palm oil is Indonesia and Malaysia these two countries so if all the Muslims come together we'll have control over palm oil we'll have control over natural gases we'll have control over petrol if all unitedly we'll be a big force and if someone tries to bully us all of us will be united unfortunately today many of the Muslim countries are helping the enemies of Islam in attacking the other Muslim country because they want to have an upper edge against the Muslim country. It is totally haram to do this. You are being partner with other, other Muslim countries. Sorry, with other non- One Muslim country is being partner with other non-Muslim country to overpower the other Muslim country. This is totally not allowed. we should be united we may have our differences but just because we want to prove that we are better than the other muslim country we are seeing to it that we are spending money to destroy our muslim brother today we have some of the muslim countries are spending billions of dollars to destroy the other muslim country just because they want to be superior 
than the other Muslim countries. This is against the principles of Islam. If all the Muslim countries unite, whether big or small, whether powerful or not, if all the unite, if we have a united army, a Muslim army of all the countries put together, then no one will be able to blackmail us. You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the black gold. We have the wealth. If we unite, we should use this wealth to promote Islam, not to destroy Islam. So if this is there, then we have all the international organization. If there is a WHO, World Health Organization, we should have a World Muslim Health Organization, WMHO. And these health rules should be based on Quran and Sunnah. Unfortunately, we are blindly following the rules made by the non-Muslims. Some may be correct, some may not be correct. So if we have unity amongst all the Muslim countries, all the 57 Muslim countries, more than 2 billion Muslims, 27% of the Muslims, if there is an Interpol, international police, there should be an Islamic pole, Islam pole, that is Islamic police. If we have un unity in all aspects of life, and if some Muslim country is breaking the law of the Quran and Sunnah, the other Muslim countries can get together and correct their Muslim country. Why should we allow the non-Muslim to interfere in the affairs of the affairs of the Muslims? So if we have an internal check amongst ourselves, and our constitution should be Quran and the Sahih Hadith. If we follow this, inshallah, within a few years, within a decade, Muslim countries will be on the top. And irrespective of what's happening today, we find the question posed about the Muslim leaders and the Muslim countries today. There is one silver lining. The silver lining is that there is a hadith, there is a prophecy of a beloved Prophet Muhammad that towards the end of time, and if you go on my Facebook, I've started a series of the signs of the end of the world. Minor signs and major signs. And there are more than 80 minor signs out of which there are approximately 50 or there are approximately 45 that have already occurred. And there are approximately 40 that are pending not yet occurred. And then there are 10 major signs. But towards the end of the world, a beloved Prophet Muhammad prophesies that may the salam will come, Isa alayhi salam will come, may the salam, may the salam would be the leader and the Muslims would rule the world for seven years. That would be the golden years for the Muslims. And that time, inshallah, they will follow Islam and the Khilafat again would be revived. And that time, whether you want it or don't want it, I want it or don't want it, this would be the best time. So there's a silver lining. I only pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may we live till that time when Mehdi alayhi salam come, so that at least we will support him. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi has given Basharat that that group of Muslims that will support Mehdi alayhi salam, they have been promised paradise. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he come during our time, during my time, and I would be the first person to support him and would love to see how Islam flourishes. And we wait for that time. Till the time he comes, we don't know how long will it take, few weeks, few months, few years, few decades, Allah Alam. What we should do? We should follow Quran and Sunnah and see to it that we force our leaders to follow Quran and Sunnah and the Muslims should be united on the ban of Quran and Sahih Hadith. Inshallah, again, we'll be a superpower. Next question pose by Kinsa Saif from Lahore, Pakistan. I am an electrical engineer. I want to say that you are my favorite human being on this earth. I'm a huge fan of yours. May Allah grant me the Iman you possess. Amin. And may Allah give you the reward for your hard work in his path. Amin. May you live a very beautiful and long life Amin. Many E's are there. Amin. We need you a lot. The Muslim Ummah needs you. I also want to spread Islam and become a Dai. Please pray for me. Inshallah, may Allah make you a Dai. I really wish I had a father like you. The values and Islamic teachings of Islam you have given to your children, I wish you were my father. 
Sir, I want to ask one question. Hope it won't be personal. I see you as a perfect human being, but everyone has flaws, right? Yes, you are right. I want to know what are your bad habits you want to change or what is that bad thing in you which you want to change or trying your level best to overcome that thing. I am asking because I believe that there would be nothing you want to change, right? Question mark. Sir, I also want to ask what is your favorite food and of which country? I think biryani must be your favorite as you have mentioned biryani in your talks a lot. The sister is basically, she is a fan of mine and and she has praised me and may Allah not hold me responsible for whatever she has said. Uh, may Allah forgive her for what she does not know about me and may Allah make me better than what she thinks about me. Regarding, uh, as she, she said that she thinks I am a perfect human being and that's totally wrong and she says that every human being has a fault and she's right. My answer is that I have got several umpteen number of faults. The best exemplary human being is our beloved Prophet Muhammad And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Kalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, that verily in the Prophet will you find a beautiful pattern of conduct. Allah says in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, verily in the Prophet is a beautiful example to follow. So the best exemplary human being on the face of the earth is our beloved Prophet Muhammad He is the best. Regarding what are the faults in me and Allah says in the Quran, it is human to err. I have got many faults. What would I like to change? Number one, I would like to increase my knowledge. The knowledge I have is less than a drop in the ocean. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me more knowledge, more knowledge. And I pray Rabbi Zidni Ilma that may Allah increase my knowledge. And I keep on praying and I do a lot of du'as for many things. For a halal income and may my actions be accepted by Allah, there are many du'as. Regarding one flaw that I have that, what do you say in English language, I'm a perfectionist. No human being is perfect, I know that. But there's an English word called a perfectionist and I want to make everything the best. This trait of being a perfectionist is good and bad both. In most of the things it benefits me, but sometimes it becomes a burden. Everything that I want to do, I want to do it to the best. And sometimes things which are not important also, I waste my time trying to make it better. I'll give you a simple example. That when I send text messages to my staff, and some of my staff don't even know English well. But since I have to communicate, they send me a message. And when I'm giving them a reply, because of the typo error, O becomes I and I becomes O, and if the spelling is wrong, there's a mistyping error is there. I go out of the way to go and correct it and read it. That's not required. The person doesn't know English well. So what difference does it make that if there is a spelling error? But that is my nature. I'm a perfectionist. I try and do whatever. I'm not a perfect human being at all. I'm a perfectionist. My nature is to try and make everything to the best. And that's very helpful in the field of Dawa, in the field of Islam. I try and strive a lot to see to it that whatever I do, whether it be a little thing or a medium thing or a big thing, I do it, I do it to the best of my ability. This is good and bad also. In more cases it is good, but sometimes it wastes your time in small things and it prevents you from doing other good things. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to remove all my faults and, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he accept my efforts whatever is in his way. The main thing is Mel accept your effort. And whatever said and done, one thing is for sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me millions and billions of times. And the niyama that He has given me, I would not like to exchange my position when my position with anyone in this world. And all the people that I know, I don't know everyone in the world, but all the people that I know, the kings and the presidents and the prime minister of the country and the celebrities, all that I know, I am happy to be what I am, as I am, as a package. There are many things I want to improve, but if anyone tells me that if Allah gives you the option, would you like to swap your position with anyone in the world living today? I am happy with what I am. 
I'm not claiming that I'm the best human being in the world. No way am I claiming that I'm the best Muslim in the world. There may be many Muslims who will be 100 times better than me. We may not be knowing about them. But up among the people that we know, the kings, I'm happy with what I am. Because as a package, I'm happy that my akhirah at least is secured, inshallah, if Allah accepts my effort, rather than the position of the celebrities and this king and the prime minister and the presidents. How many of them would go to Jannah? Allah knows the best. So whatever I am, I thank Allah for the position he has given me. For all the qualities, I have got very, very negligible qualities, but Allah has put love in the hearts of millions of people who love me. So the love is not because I'm a good speaker. It is because Allah has done a favor to me. And Allah has put love for me in your hearts. Otherwise, there are thousands of people who have more knowledge than me. There are tens of thousands of people who are more intelligent than me. There are tens of thousands of people who are better orators than me. But yet Allah has put that love in the hearts of the human me for me. There are hundreds of thousands of non-Muslims who love me. There are millions of Muslims who love me, alhamdulillah. So this is only haza min fazli rabbi. It is only because of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what Allah has given me niyama, I would not like to exchange my position with anyone presently living in this world. There may be hundreds of people better than me who I may not be aware of. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive my mistakes and forgive my sins. Regarding the last question, that which is my best food? Is it biryani? My best food, before I was married, it was the food made by my mother. And now, it is the best food for me, is the food made by my wife. I'm a person who's satisfied, mashallah, because I see more for the things which will get me benefit in Akhara. The food that my wife makes, I'm not claiming she's the best cook, but for me, she makes the best food for me. And I would prefer the kari khichdi made by my wife than the biryani. I do use the word biryani in my lecture because biryani is a delicacy for the people of the Indian subcontinent, for the people of India, for the people of Pakistan. That's the reason I give examples of food which are popular. If it's a kari khichdi, they may not, most many, that, one, that will not be the best food for many of the human beings. So the simple food made by my wife, I prefer than the biryani made by the chef outside. And I'm very satisfied and I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to give me this position. Question posed by Kashfia Meherin. Assalamu alaikum, sir. This is from the Facebook, just received. What will we do in Eid al Adha during this coronavirus pandemic situation? Is it compulsory to give Qurbani during this situation? As you know, that Qurbani is a recommendation of the Prophet that those who can afford should give, those who are poor, they need not give. But those who can afford should give even one animal for the full family sufficient if the person can afford and give one animal per person one goat that's also acceptable but those who have the means to give should give why should corona virus stop a person from giving for doing kurbani i don't know during corona virus yet we're having mutton we're having beef we're having chicken so why should it if you feel personally because of the situation in your area, you cannot slaughter, then very well you can give to an organization to slaughter on your behalf. But if you have the means to give Qurbani, you should give Qurbani, it is recommended. And coronavirus should not stop you from that. A 
अबू हुरैरा बट यू आर ग्रेट आई लव यू माउद जिया दिस ऑन द फेसबुक डॉक्टर जाकिर आई विश यू आर ओके मे गॉड ब्लेस यू एंड प्रोटेक्ट यू वेर एवर यू आर वी आर प्रेइंग फॉर यू ऑल द टाइम फ्रॉम अल्जीरिया माशा हैप्पी जोवियल खान यू आर माई फेवरेट ह्यूमन बींग टू दिस इज फ्रॉम द फेसबुक This is a question from Ismail Ahmed Naks from Somalia. My question is how does a person go out buy a home in the west without interest riba? As far as if you don't have the money to buy the house completely then but natural you should not take loan from the conventional bank which is riba based that is is haram but many of the western countries have islamic alternative you can go to an islamic bank whether it be in uk whether it be in america there are islamic bank which work on the sharia principles you can take a loan from the islamic bank which is not based on riba it is based on a particular system called ijara and various other options are there or it can be cost plus in this system very well you can take from islamic bank and pay in installment this is not dealing with riba this is one of the ways that you can do or or there are many muslim organization which have a pool of money where they internally help members among themselves <coughs> where they give a loan to the member of the organization who pays in installments so as long as it is not riba based it is as per the sharia it is sharia compliant very well you can use this system in purchasing the house but taking from a conventional bank which is riba based is totally haram <clears throat> we have on the facebook mohsin gaffar we have aisha arsalan siraj tanveer mal zad ashfaq ahmed zarri all on the facebook ahmed eid kaniki ken new thin ay humaira hijra mamudul hasan मनिक राम मोहम्मद नाज मोहम्मद फैजान खान रहमान अख्तर मोहम्मद फैजान खान इमरान इस्माइल असरार वदूद लव यू सर अस्सलाम वालेकुम वालेकुम अस्सलाम असलम वरहत लरकत ऑल दीज वेल विशेज from the from the facebook the next question is from rit banik sir i became a big fan of yours since few months i admire your knowledge i was a non muslim now i am a muslim by belief but not yet official reversion has taken place inshallah that too will be done as far as rid banik is concerned if you have you believe that you are a muslim and you believe that there is one allah subhanahu wa taala and you believe that prophet muhammad is a messenger you are a muslim there is nothing like official reversion in islam like in which they have in other religion like uh, baptism or tying the thread no in islam as long as you believe that there is no one worthy of worship and there is no god but allah and you believe that prophet muhammad is the messenger of allah you are a muslim you don't have to tell to the world but the moment you become a muslim you have to follow 
the rules and regulation of Islam. You have to pray five times a day. So if you do not tell people for you to pray, you may have to hide and pray. So my advice to you is that tell the people as soon as possible so that it will be easier for you to practice Islam. Since you believe in Islam, according to me, you're already a Muslim. But see to it that you fulfill your faraiz, be in the company of those who are practicing Muslim so that you learn more about the deen and you practice it. If you tell to the others, people may feel bad, may feel hurt, but it will be easier for you to practice your deen and easier for you to go to Jannah and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he accept your efforts. All your past sins have been forgiven the moment you accept Islam and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put you in Jannah and Firdos. Amen. The next question, Mannan Ahmed Sheikh from Kashmir, India. There is a very popular video game known as PUBG, P-U-B-G, that is spreading all over the world. And it has nowadays become an addiction to all people, that everyone plays it continuously every day. <laughs> everyone plays it continuously every day. MashaAllah. <laughs> Recently, the new updated version of this video game came out in which a person has to glorify idols in the game to gain weapons and power. Is it haram or shirk to play this kind of game or is it okay if any Muslim plays this kind of game in which we have to glorify idols? A similar question is posed by Abdullah from New Jersey, USA. Is it permissible to play video games? I would first answer the second question and then answer the first question. As far as video games are concerned, there is a revolution in the past few years and past few decades. I remember when I was a teenager, maybe about 35 years back, there were video game parlors where we had to pay some money and we could, for a few minutes, maybe drive a car. So those sort of video games which were there 30, 35 years back, not that I was a fan of video games, but I did play a few times in my life. So those are games which is for entertainment and I feel there is no problem at all. But in the passage of time, unfortunately, today we find that there is a revolution and there's a lot of changes that have come. And when you read articles about the video games, unfortunately, most of these video games, they are haram. The reason is that many of these video games, they are mixed with elements which are prohibited in Islam. I'll give you a few examples. For example, there are video games which, in which there are a lot of killing. And the more number of people you kill, the more marks you get and you become a winner. Some of the killings are unnecessary, it's murder. And murder in Islam, killing any innocent human being is the second major sin in Islam. There are some video games which glorify witchcraft, which is the third major sin in Islam. There are some video games which are attacking Islam. And the video game says that if you bomb Makkah, then you get 1000 points. If you bomb Medina, then you get 500 points. If you bomb Jerusalem, then you get 200 points. So these, and there are some games which show that there is a non-Muslim country fighting with a Muslim country and the Muslim country is normally the weaker country and if you defeat the Muslim country, you win the game. So these sorts of games which are belittling Islam and are criticizing Islam and against the prince of Islam, all these are haram. There are many video games in which there is nudity. Today, if, if you have most of the car racing game, I'm told I read articles, in between you'll find ladies coming which are not properly dressed. They come in bikini. They come in scantily dressed clothes, bodies mostly, and all this is haram. There is nudity, there is obscenity. Even in sports you find obscenity. Invariably not there just to make the game more popular. You have games in which there is gambling. You have games in which there is drinking of alcohol. So all these things are haram. Even though you may not be drinking yourself physically, but virtually, if it's involving or haram activity, that game is haram. It takes the children away from Islam. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are many Muslim parents 
who willingly buy such game for the children. They don't scrutinize whether the game is right or wrong. They say, oh, bachcha hai, kid hai, what's the problem? He's not drinking. What's the problem? He's not killing anyone. That's just in a game. These parents are actually taking the children away from Islam. They are ruining their life. If anyone would be held responsible, it's not the child, it's the parents. And today, if they want to get rid of the child or they want to keep the child quiet, they give them the mobile phone. So that, you know, the child is busy with the mobile phone and the parents can do what they want. They can do, they can do their work on the social media. And what's happening? They give mobile phone to a small child of four years, five years. Happy, my child can operate the mobile. You are ruining your child. What is so great in handling a mobile? When he grows up and required, he'll easily know how to use it. Why give a mobile phone to a child and let him play this video game, most of which are haram? So if you analyze today's video games, majority, they are involved. Most of them have got music. The music is haram in Islam. They have got such sound effects. So most of these games, if you analyze and if you scrutinize, majority, maybe more than 80 percent, more than 90 percent, or maybe a larger number, I haven't done a survey, but, but reading the reports, they will lead to haram activities directly or indirectly. So such game surely should be prohibited and you should try and keep your children away from them. As far as the first question was posed regarding a game called PUBG, PUBG, the full form of PUBG is Player Unknown Battleground. Many people who play the game may not be knowing the full form. Anyway, I don't play this game. I just did a, because of the news that for the last couple of weeks, a lot of news has been coming regarding this PUBG. So I just went and checked up the background. This game is one of the most popular game in the world today. It was launched in March 2017, more than three years back, the trial version. And the full version was launched in December 2017, about two and a half years back. And in by the end of 2019, it had the maximum sale. It sold, till now, it has sold more than 60 million games. And only on the mobile, there are 600 million downloads. 600 million downloads. That means somewhere close to 8% of the world have downloaded it. And amongst the children, it would be somewhere close to more than one third of the children have one third or close to it have downloaded this. And in this game, this game mainly involves killing. The more you kill, the more points you get. And you have to save yourself. And if you are the last person alive, you are the winner. This game can be played solo by one person, can be played up to 100 people. You can play alone, you can play with your friends, you can play online, you can even play in groups of two, three or four. Then if your group survives, your group is the winner. It's an addiction. And many of these video games, including this PUBG, it takes a person away from Islam, there are haram acts. Besides that, besides that, if it is the time for salah, when the prayer call is there for azan, the child continues, okay, no problem, and he misses the salah. And there may be chances that if he doesn't miss, he will pray at the last moment when the salah is just going to get kaza. Just before the time for the next salah, he prays the previous salah. <coughs> so all these things take the person away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This addiction is not only causing problem to Muslim children, even to non-Muslim children. So much so that there are programs that have been created for de-addiction of PUBG. But the question mainly is talking about the latest version. The latest version was the latest version of PUBG was launched on the 28th of April 2020, about one and a half month ago. And in this new version, a person has to glorify idols or literally do idol worship. 
in order to get weapons or get equipment which will help them to kill other people. So this is going to the highest level of shirk. Murder is the second major sin in Islam. Shirk is the major sin in Islam. So of course it's totally haram. The, besides the other aspect of murder, of music, of nudity, etc. Idol worship is the major sin. It is promoting idol worship. So surely we should see to it that the parents are very strict. They should not only not give PUBG, should not give video games. There may be some games which may be halal. Entertainment per se, if it doesn't break the Sharia, it is permitted. There may be some video games which may not be having these elements or there may be some Sharia compliant video games that will be in the market. But the best is avoid the general game unless you are sure that it is Sharia compliant. It doesn't break any of the principles of Islam. I request the Muslim parents not to be lazy and not to give them these games so that you know they can do their work without being disturbed. You are, ru you are ruining the life of your children as well as your life because one of the ways for you to go to Jannah is a pious child praying for you. So this game PUBG surely is haram. Previously there are many fatwas that are haram. Now after the new version where there is glorifying the idols including idol worship, it's totally haram and I request the Muslim parents and the Muslim children stay away from it and don't, and don't play this game. The next question from Anonymous. I am a Hindu girl. I was in a relationship with a Muslim guy for three years. We were in a kind of live-in relationship. However, through him I started liking Islam. Now he has dumped me without any reason. Will Allah be angry with him? What punishment will he get? I cry every day thinking of him. We both are from India but studying abroad. Regarding this uh, Hindu sister, that she says that she was in love with a Muslim boy and they were living in a live-in relationship, that means living together without getting married and staying together and, and you know what happens. But after some time he left her and he dumped her, but she got close to Islam because of him. And now she cries thinking about him. Her question is that will Allah punish her? And what punishment will he get? Number one, live in relationship in Islam is haram. It's not permitted at all. A girl and a boy who are nam haram, living together, is totally haram in Islam. Only after marriage can a husband and wife live together or brother, sister, fine. But the unknown man and woman, Unless they marry, they cannot live together, live in a relationship just to experience that's a haram. So for that, it is a major sin. Because they live in a relationship, there is illicit uh, relationship. And it becomes the 11th major sin or the 10th major sin in Islam, adultery or fornication. And Allah will punish him for that. Then the question was that, you cry and thinking about him. My suggestion to you, sister, is that I would look at it in a different way. In your question, you said that because of that boy, you came close to Islam. So according to me, if I was in your place and you started liking Islam, what I would have done, I would have actually thanked him. Because he has brought you close to Islam. What he has done with you is wrong. I am not condoning him at all. If he left you, for what reason he left you, I don't know. But if he has promised you that he's going to be with you and he left you, it is haram. There may be various reasons unless we don't know the reasons why he left you. I may not be able to tell. But live in relationship itself is haram, he'll be punished for that. But the good point in this, the silver lining in this is that because of him you came close to Islam. It is like someone giving you a million dollar and then robbing one thousand dollar from that million dollar and you're crying. Why did he rob that one thousand dollar? You should not be pessimistic, you should be optimist. You should be happy. He gave you a million dollar. 
He robbed one thousand dollar is wrong, but he's given you a million dollar. From that million dollar, nine hundred ninety-nine thousand dollar is yours. He only robbed one thousand dollar. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number two hundred sixteen, that you may hate a thing which may be good for you, and you may love a thing which is not good for you. Allah knows, and you don't know. So in this situation, if that boy has got you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has got you closer to Islam, and you have learned tawhid about it, then it is worth it. If he, has, if he has ditched you, he has done a mistake, Allah will punish him. What my suggestion to you, sister, is that if you have come close to Islam, accept Islam, study Islam. I'm sure you may be believing that there's no God but one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should not associate partners with that God. You should not do idol worship. And believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger. If you believe that there is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, you become a Muslim, that is worth more than all the wealth in the world. Million dollars is a small example. Because on the day of judgment, the unbelievers, when they'll be put in hellfire, they will not complain to Allah that you are unjust. They will say, we do not mind giving you the full world and the wealth in it to save us. But God will say, Allah will say, it's too late. So what you have got is a treasure system. Keep it with it, love it, and cash it. See to it that you practice Islam. Surely you will find some good Muslim boy who will like you, who will marry you, and inshallah your life may be better. Maybe later on you'll thank Allah that okay, it was infatuation that I liked the previous boy, but the new brother, but, but the new person who you have married will turn out to be a better husband, will be love, will be loving you more. So look at it in the positive sense, and maybe you start doing dua to the boy that left you. So look at it with an optimistic view, sister, not a pessimist view. And inshallah, maybe you start praying for him that what he has done is brought you closer to Islam. The next question, what is your opinion on the groups of Muslim who protest against the closing of mosques due to coronavirus on the basis that that would imply fearing other than Allah? The question posed is that what is my view regarding those Muslims who are protesting against the closure of the mosque in different parts of the world and they are saying that you are fearing others more than Allah. As far as I am concerned, I am against those people who go to extreme. La taglu fi dinukum. Do not commit excesses in your deen. As far as the guidance given by the Prophet Muhammad the Prophet clearly said in Sahih Bukhari, in various hadiths which I discussed in my previous sessions, that when you know of an epidemic, of a plague in a particular land, don't go to that land. And if you're in that land, don't leave that land. Where is Hadith? The Prophet said, if you see a leper, if you see a leper, run away from him as though you have seen a tiger, as though you have seen a lion. So all these Hadith say that we should stay away from contagious diseases. But the Prophet said, tie your camel and trust in God. Now what we have situation, as for the group of people who are against the closure of mosque, we'll discuss that later on. What if you see the different scenario world over of Muslim countries? The first Muslim country, I won't take its name, the first Muslim country that openly announced that they're going to shut the mosque because of coronavirus. In that country, there was not a single death due to coronavirus. There were few, hardly about 40, 50 positive cases of coronavirus, COVID-19. As a precaution, they closed the mosque in complete country. Many Muslim scholars objected. And within a few days, many Muslim countries all over the world followed it. I am not against closing the mosque to protect yourself from COVID-19 if it's a requirement. But don't go overboard to give a statement that 
you should fear Allah and no one else is not correct because the Prophet was the person who feared Allah much more than us. He said, run away from a leper as though you have seen a lion. He said, when you know of a play, don't enter that city. If you are in that land, don't leave that land. These are precautions. We trust in God, but we have to tie a camel. But what we see that some of the Muslim country were over precautious. They are not tying the camel, they are strangulating the camel. In some countries, when there is not even a single case of coronavirus, COVID-19, they shut the mosque. This is nonsense. If there is a case where the cases are many and many people are infected, there are people who have died, and then you close the mosque after taking guidance from the medical experts and Islamic scholars. Only hearing the medical experts who don't know about the deen, who don't know about the religion, that how important it is to pray in the mosque, you cannot take the advice. Quran says, first alu al zikri in talamun. That if you don't know, ask the person who is knowledgeable. Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43. And Surah Ambiya chapter 21 verse number 7. So there should be a striking balance. So if the infection has spread quite a lot, and you think that opening the mosque will really cause many more people to be infected, not just being over precautious. So there should be a striking balance between the two. So those people who are not bothered about prevention and telling that we should have faith in Allah, they are wrong. And those people who are over precautious and closing it beforehand, even they are wrong. So we should not commit excesses in your religion. Allah says in the Quran, La taglu fi dinukum. Do not commit excesses in your religion. Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 171. So my view is that even if you take precautions, as I mentioned in my earlier answer, take precautions. You can take a sajjada, you can take a musalla, a prayer mat, wear a mask, hand sanitization can be done, do wudu at home, spend the least time in the mosque, uh, go to the uh, restroom in your house, don't shake hands, read the sunnah salah before the farah salah at home, after the farah salah sunnah at home. Take all these precautions and continue till you think it is possible. When you think it is really required to close, and then you close, I've got no objection. But don't be over precautious. And when the thing subsides, also open it as soon as possible. If you take precaution and, and proper guidance, having a proper session with the health authorities and the Islamic scholars in consultation, and then taking the decision, it's correct. But just taking a decision to please the world or to please the other people, or to say, no, I will continue praying, this is not Islamic. So don't commit excesses, follow the middle path. We have on the Facebook Akbar Khan, Muhammad Irfan, Imran Ismail, Asrar Vadud, Fawzi Khatun, Arif Ahmed. Someone wants to know the WhatsApp number. The WhatsApp number where you can ask question in brief, as well as mentioning your name, profession, and city, and country of origin, is plus six zero. Double one two six nine five three eight nine five. Tanzila Khan, Omar Sharif, Noor Alam Bidut, Sheikh Robin, Sardar Khalid, Salman Sheikh, Bilal Harun, Amir Khan, Bengali Kita, Muhammad Mustafa, Nila Sayyid. Muhammad Rabi Hussain, Moad Nairoz, Tandila Khan, 
السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام و رحمۃ برکاتہ درس آن دا فیس بک آن دا یوٹیوب وی ہیو عقیب خان تسلیمہ شریم شرمین عاقب احمد گنز رحیم روکسٹا عرافن مون ناہد خان ایچ ڈی ویڈیوز تسلیمہ شرمین حسن فاروق علی پراچا السلام علیکم علیکم السلام و رحمۃ برکاتہ The next question is, I am a ladies tailor. Is it allowed to measure a woman before sewing her clothes? Because I am the only one who can do that job. Alasan Nagum from Gambia. Alasan Nagum from Gambia asked the question that he is a lady tailor. Can he measure the ladies before sewing her clothes? And he says he's the only one who can do the job. As far as being a ladies tailor per se, stitching the clothes of ladies is not haram, but the associate things may be haram. You cannot take the measurement of a lady because she's your naam haram, unless, you know, if it's a haram of yours, your wife or your sister or your mother is permitted. But taking measurement of a lady, you have to put the measuring tape and you have to touch a body. This is prohibited in Islam. It's not permitted. What my advice is, to you can be you can have a lady assistant who does that or the best is to have a mahram with you like your daughter or your wife or your sister who can take the measurement and dictate to you and you can write down stitching clothes per se is not haram but if you measure a lady and you touch her that is haram if you think you are the best in doing this job as you said i'm the only one who can do the job and you may be a designer so as long as you do not break any of the rules of the sharia you do it in the way that sharia the sharia allows you like having a mehram lady with you who takes the measurement and then tells you and then you stitch and she takes the trial and she does the basically the talking and you don't involve in you know staring at a woman or you know touching her so if you take precaution of this then you can continue or if you cannot take my advice would to you would be that you change the job the next question by shamshad alam katihar from bihar india why allah traps or chains the devil only in the month of ramadan why does he trap them in other months as well That's a very tricky question that why does Allah trap and chain the devils only in the month of Ramadan? Why does he need and why does he do in the other month? Why does he do the full year? If you watched my earlier sessions on Ramadan, I told you that Ramadan, if you allow me to call a human being a machine, human being is the most complicated machine and Ramadan is like a servicing, like overhauling. of the complete body and every machine requires servicing some require once a year some require once in six months so ramadan is one month in a year which i would say give an analogy it is like a servicing of the body so when you're doing servicing it is good for the machine but if you say i will keep on doing servicing the full year then that's not logical so if you say that we will keep on having ramadan the full year if the devils are chained then but natural allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also have to allow the human being should tell the human being should fast the full year and fasting full year is haram in islam our beloved prophet said you cannot fast every day the maximum that if you want to do our prophet permitted keep the fast of daud alayhi salam he fasted alternate days <coughs> so fasting every day of the year is prohibited So if Allah changed the devil full year you will also have to fast because in Ramadan one of the requirement that you have to fast the the full month of Ramadan so if Allah changed the full changed the devil the full year you have to fast the full year that is point number 1 point number 2 let me give you an analogy that you know when there is there the shop the shop normally sells good and once a year maybe or once in six months they have a sale during the sale you get the goods cheap and 
and you go there and you purchase. Same way, Ramadan is one month in a year where you get many benefits. So these benefits that you get cannot be for the full year. You know, the shopkeeper allows only for, for one month. So these benefits that you have is kept for one month. But the best example analogy I can give you is of an examination. Because this life, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah khalaqal mawta wal hayata. Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So this life is a test for the hereafter. Now, if you see the test that we have in our life when we go to colleges, when we go to universities, in you have for the full year you you attend the university, you attend the college, and you have final exam only once in a year. And that final exam is more important, it may carry 80% marks, depending upon which course you are doing. And full year, you may have to attend college every day, from, from, for which marks may be given for attendance. There may be weekly test, some of the professions have daily test, you get marks. But those marks are less important as compared to the marks in the final examination. Depending upon the course you are doing, maybe final examination may carry 80% marks of the total, maybe 75% marks. The balance 20 or 25% may be for day-to-day -day activities. So similarly, this life is a test for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you rules and regulations which you should follow throughout the year. But during Ramadan, it is like the final examination. And during final examination, you study more. You study more than the normal time. So we Muslims do more ibadah in Ramadan than the normal time. But you cannot say that like the examination be throughout the year. It will be a problem. Because in, when during final examination, you do not follow your daily routine. You may do less of the other activity, less of social work, less of and concentrate more on, more on the things of the examination. Similarly, in Ramadan is not the same activity as we do in the other days. You do more ibadah, you fast, you pray more, you read the Quran more which is difficult for the full, full year. So in Ramadan, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the devil, it is possible for you to do more ibadah, it is possible for you to do more salah, it is possible for you to fast for the full month. If you say Allah will change for the full year, then full year you keep on doing more ibadah and, and, and more, it's good. But then it's difficult during the last 10 nights. Many of us stay awake full night. So imagine you have to stay awake full night for the full year, it's difficult. So everything is balanced and comes in a combination. You cannot say Allah changed the devil and then you don't stay awake the full night in the last 10 nights. That will be one third of the month of Ramadan, you are staying awake full night. So that is the reason, it's a combination together. The best example of an examination, this is like a final examination, it is more important. Therefore you give more time and you give more effort. So Ramadan is like that, in one year, one examination, you give more time, Allah changes the devil, so that you can do more ibadah and come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the marks of this is counted more. So even if you make the small mistakes and the small, small faults, Allah forgives. As Allah says that from one Ramadan to the other Ramadan, Allah washes your major, all your sins, except as long as you stay away from the major sins. Hope this answers the question. We have shortage of time, therefore we'll take just one more question. It is from Altaf Khan from Alwar, Rajasthan, India. Is it allowed to use pen or marker while reading the translation of the Quran? There is no harm in using the pen or the marker while reading the translation of the Quran. And I used to do it very often previously. And if you see my Quran that I read previously, every time I read the Quran, I used to have a different coding. I used to use the fluorescent marker. Uh, I used to use the highlighters. And I had my own code that if it's a verse dealing, dealing with Christianity, I used to highlight with pink. If it's dealing with the non-Muslims, the other non-Muslims is to be blue. With the Hindus, it's to be orange. Scientific, a different color. Dealing with Muslims, green color. So my Quran was technical like a rainbow color. And I finished the Quran, then I read second time, so then I realized that all the verses are important. Then literally almost all the verses are highlighted. So the previous, if you 
see the copies of the Quran which I showed previously 20 years back all over. Now, now I take a fresh Quran and I mark when required, not always because I've read the Quran so many times. So previously I should take, so using a pen or a marker pen, there's no problem. How many say, oh, you're insulting the Quran? Not at all. You're in the translation of the Quran and you want to highlight, you want to remember, there's no problem at all. Make use of it. As long as you utilize it more in your life, it will be better. We'll just take one more question because we have a, a couple of minutes more. Now the question posed by Dr. Abdus Shahid Dhaka, Bangladesh. I am a physician doing MD in neurology here. I am trying to be the best in my field. Here we have a lot of Hindu teachers and colleagues. How can I preach Islam among them by using my medical knowledge? That's a very good question. To answer in brief, I would request you to read my book, Quran and Modern Science, Compatible or Incompatible. I have given a lecture on that. I have given several times, you go to the YouTube and you can hear my lecture which is for about one and a half hour and followed by question answer session. As far as doing dawa with your medical colleagues or maybe your teachers or your colleagues or your students, I have given the talk on Quran Modern Science, the book is available or you can go to our website. Go to the website in the section of book, it's downloadable, the full book is downloadable, then you can go to the common question side. In the question side, there is many questions asked on this topic. Download that, read that. In short, let me tell you that Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For every book to claim that it's the word of God, for, for any revelation to prove that it is a wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should stand the test of time. Previously, in the olden age, it was the age of miracles and the glorious Quran is the miracle of miracles. Then came the age of literature and poetry and Alhamdulillah, Muslim and non-Muslim Arabic scholars unanimously agree that Quran is the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today is not the age of literature and poetry, today is the age of science and technology. So we have to analyze the Quran with science and let me remind you that Quran is not a book of science S-C-I-E-N-C-E -E, but it's a book of signs S-I-G-N-S -S. and there are more than 6,000 signs ayats in the glorious Quran out of which more than a thousand speak about science and if you compare with today modern knowledge about science you find that there are many things which science has discovered recently, 10 years back, 20 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, which the Quran has mentioned 1400 years ago. If you put this and see my full lecture, you will be able to convince if a person is a scientist or a person who loves science. If you quote to them the matter in my book, Quran Modern Science, inshallah, he'll be impressed. And in my college, in my medical college when I was in Bombay, in Nair Hospital, Topiwala National Medical College, Muslims were hardly about 3 or 4 percent. In a batch of 100, maybe 3 or 4 were Muslims. And whenever I used to do dawa with my colleagues, my Muslim friends used to run away. Abhi to marwaenga, that Dakir is going to get us bashed up now. They used to run away, but Alhamdulillah, no one in my medical college or ever in my life has even caught my collar. MashaAllah, Allah's help. But while doing dawa, my Muslim friends used to run away and I was, you know, surrounded with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 non-Muslims. But these non-Muslims became very close to me. While I used to do dawa, I used to do dawa even with my teachers. So many of my Muslim friends will say, Zakir, okay, now you will fail. They will fail you in the exam. And to fail, a medical student is very easy. Because 50% marks is based on the theory paper and 50% marks is on viva was oral question. And no one can question the teacher, the professor, why have you failed me in Viva Vos? My Muslim friend used to tell me, Takir, surely you will fail. I used to reply, if Allah wants to fail me, maybe Allah wants me to, wants to give me one more year opportunity to do dawa to my teachers. I was an optimist. They used to call me the philosopher. And every opportunity I got, I used to do dawa with my teachers, with my colleagues. 
Alhamdulillah, and most of them, they loved me, they had faith on me, they respected me. I'm talking about the non-Muslim colleagues and non-Muslim teachers. I request you read this book and convey to them with hikmah, but do it nicely with love and care. And that was the last question I could answer in this session. And just to remind you that inshallah, those questions which I have not answered, I'll pick up one of them and call them on a video call on the WhatsApp. That would be a bonus and speak to them for a few minutes. And till we meet next time for this program, ask Dr. Zakir. Same time next Saturday, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa akhru dawan alhamdulillah bil alameen.